Hi, this is the voice, Michael Shavello. You're listening to the Premium Odds Cast, hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Kuhn, and MMA journalist Brian Heminger. The absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting, MMAOddsBreaker.com. Welcome to the Premium Odds Cast, presented by Five Dime Sportsbook. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts odds maker Nick Kalikas to break down this Saturday's UFC Fight Night 89 event, which takes place in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. If you're unfamiliar with our format, myself and Nick will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Looking back at our last event, our premium package bets for UFC 199 went one and one to profit 0.8 units. We won our bets on Sean Strickland, but lost our play on Dong Hyung Maestro Kim. We also won our one unit free bet on Benil Dariush. Back to the present, UFC Fight Night 89 features a 13 fight card in total and will be aired on UFC Fight Pass Fox Sports 2 and Fox Sports 1 this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. Now kicking off the preliminary card on Fight Pass, we have a flyweight contest between Ali Bagautinov, who is 13 and 4, and Gene Herrera, who is 9 and 1. Now Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Bagatinov, minus 190, the comeback on Herrera, plus 150. Right now looking over at our sponsored sportsbook, 5dimes.eu. Currently, they have Bagatinov minus 265. The comeback on Herrera is plus 225. So needless to say, action coming in on Bagatinov early on. I understand it. I mean, the guy has had back-to-back losses, but look at those losses. To the champion, Mighty Mouse right now, Demetrius Johnson, which is pound for pound probably the best fighter in the sport. I know Jones can make an argument for that, but still, I think – Demetrius Johnson is amazing, and uh, so you got to—that's a respectable loss. Nobody's going to beat him right now at 125. And then also, Benavides was the last loss uh, for Bagatinov as well. So he basically made it to the top of the food chain, has competed against the best, has some quality wins on his resume along the way, and not just that. I mean, Bagatinov stylistically—he's he, a nightmare matchup for most people. He's got good wrestling, he's got power on the feet, he got, has good footwork. He's just a complete fighter. Has some submission game to go along with it. So he's a tough, tough out, and he deserves to be in that kind of upper tier at 125 and around the title mix for sure. So this is a big step up in competition for Herrera. Now Herrera made his UFC debut on short notice, took on Ray Borg, had a pretty fun fight with Borg, but wasn't successful there. But he did bounce back against Sanchez in his last fight and got the W. So he's one and one right now in the UFC. He looked very good against Sanchez. I mean, he showed what he's made of. I think Herrera is a very talented finisher. Uh, He's capable of knocking people out. He's capable of winning fights by submission on the ground as well. His takedown defense overall is pretty solid. Again, I guess Borg, it didn't look that way, and he's going to have to fend off some takedown attempts here against Megatinov as well, so not an easy fight for him, but overall, I think he is the more dangerous finisher here, and I think he is getting more confident as he grows as far as in the UFC, the longer he is a part of the organization, the long, as long as he is training and, and getting around that atmosphere, he's just going to continue to get better fight by fight is what I'm trying to spit out here, Herrera. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a much better version of Herrera in this fight. And I think he's going to give Bagatinov all he can handle. So for me, this is a tough fight. I think the line is a little bit too high right now. I think people are, are counting Herrera out a little bit too much, even though I do have to respect Bagatinov. And I am going to pick him because I think he can get some takedowns along the way and, and possibly grinds out a decision win here. But I think it's going to be a battle, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if Herrera finds a way to pull off this upset. Now, that's saying a lot because, again, Demetrius Johnson couldn't finish Bagatinov. Benavides couldn't finish him. So will Herrera... Probably not. Again, in my head, that's why I'm leaning a little bit more towards Bagatinov as well. So I am going to pick Bagatinov to win, but I'm expecting a classic battle here at 125. Bagatinov is definitely dropping down in the stock after the the PED suspension, after losing convincingly to Demetrius Johnson, and then in his return, losing to Joseph Benavides. Granted, Benavides Johnson are numbers one and two in the weight class, unless maybe you're counting... Horiguchi in there but um you know Gene Herrera while he's young and aggressive and dangerous I mean he's still not quite on Bagatinov's level uh if the Bagatinov shows up that you know mauled John Lineker was able to take him down repeatedly took him out of his game then he should win 
even if the Bagotinov shows up that, uh, you know, just kind of picked apart a couple of his opponents, was able to get some early knockouts uh, in the beginning of his UFC run, if that one shows up, then he should have still win. Uh, so I'm definitely leaning Bagotinov. Herrera had a terrific knockout in his last bout. I mean, just went all out, landed a monster shot in the second round and put his opponent out. But uh huge step up in competition for him. Uh, he's actually better on the ground than he is on the feet, even if he did pull off that impressive uh, knockout standing in his last fight. Um, but uh, Herrera is a bit wild on the feet. He is powerful. Uh, Bagotina is powerful, too. And on the ground, Bagotina should have the wrestling edge. Uh, Herrera might have the submission edge, though. He is a very fun grappler. I mean, his fight against Ray Borg was extremely entertaining, and Herrera took that one on short notice. So Herrera's dangerous. He's going to be exuberant. He's going to be aggressive. He's going to be a bit wild. And if Bagotinov is taking him lightly, Herrera could pull off a shocker. But that being said, Bagotinov should have the skills and patience to either pick up a decision victory or potentially finish Herrera with a, a big punch on the feet. So I'm leaning Bagotinov, but not insanely confident about it. Now, moving up to the welterweight division, we have Colby Covington, who is 8-1, and one, taking on UFC newcomer Jonathan Moynier, who is 7-0. and oh. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? I've been Covington minus 300, the comeback on Mounier plus 220. Right now it's Covington minus 300, the comeback on Mounier is plus 250. Looking across the down best screen, it looks like there's, there's lower than 300s out there. There's 285s out there. There's 275s out there possibly. So it's a ballpark between 280 and 300 across the board for Covington. So solid three to one favor basically. And it is a pretty tough fight for both guys. I mean, Mounier, of course, is making his debut on short notice, super short notice, really replacing uh, his teammate Alex Garcia. He has a Taekwondo kickboxing background. He's a big, athletic, powerful welterweight. So he's got a lot of good things about him. I mean, coming into his UFC debut, I mean, he's training with a great camp, obviously, in TriStar. And the, with his teammates, they've already experienced, I mean, the highest level of competition. So that's obviously not going to uh, be a bad thing for Mounier. But stylistically, what he likes to do, even though he has a Taekwondo and kickboxing background and he's long for the weight class, he likes to take the fight to the ground, get on top, pound guys out a little bit more. Um, he even, even looks for the sub as well. So he's more of a ground fighter for being known as a striking base fighter. Um, it's weird because I think he does some of his best work really from the outside, but he gets a little bit tentative at times as well, and he wants to close distance and again get the takedowns. Against Covington, I don't think he's going to have success. I doubt we see Covington put on his back. I mean, for Covington, he is the wrestler. He is the guy that's going to look for the takedowns. He is That's his game, game plan, his game style. That's exactly what he looks for, and that's what he utilizes the best. Now, of course, he's with a good camp at American Top Team. He's always getting better. His stand-up game is improving, but it's really – Nothing to brag about at this point. I mean, Covington is definitely vulnerable on the feet. He can't get clipped. He can't get put out. And if, if Mounier gets top position on Covington, I wouldn't be surprised to see Mounier beat him there as well. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think Covington is going to find the takedowns here. I think he is going to get superior position. I wouldn't be surprised if Covington also finds a sub along the way, especially if Mounier starts to gas as the fight goes on. So I think Covington is going to be able to grind out Mounier here. I mean, in his last fight, you got to give Covington credit. I mean, he was undefeated before his last to Alves. I mean, that was a fight that a lot of people are looking forward to him to that fight. He just made a mistake. I mean, against Alves, if you get caught up in that guillotine choke, you're probably not getting out of it. And that's exactly what happened to him. So I don't think Mounier is that dangerous as far as, you know, getting around his neck and, and putting Covington out. So I think he's got to have a little bit of freedom to even make a few mistakes on the ground here in this matchup. But Ultimately, I think Covington is going to win by getting this fight to the floor and just kind of wearing Munye out and possibly finishing him late. But I think Covington is going to do his thing and win this fight. Yeah, Jonathan Munye is a solid overall fighter. I just think this is a, a tricky matchup for him considering his fighting style. Even though he, he comes from a bit of a striking background, his stand-up isn't that impressive. He doesn't really pack a lot of power on the feet. He doesn't really sit on his punches very well. And for the most part, he's kind of looking to close the distance. And in his fights, he uh, usually picks up a trip or something, a body lock, uh, picks up a takedown, gets in top position, works to advance. And then when he gets some space from top position, that's where he does his damage. I mean, brutal ground and pound, good elbows. 
Um, that's where he's picked up a, a lot of his victories. Now, against Colby Covington, I just don't see that happening. Um, first of all, Mounier's takedowns, the, the trips, the body locks, I think if you close the distance like that, Covington will just ragdoll him to the canvas. Covington is a very aggressive, very powerful wrestler. Um, big double legs, and then his singles are fine. And when he gets top position, he doesn't usually let it up either. So I think if uh, Mounier closes the distance, he's going to end up on his back. And we haven't seen a lot of uh, Mounier in a defensive position. And I think that's where he's going to have some trouble. On the feet, Covington has started to improve a little bit on the, in the stand-up. And he should be able to hold his own with Mounier because Mounier really just kind of picks his shots on the feet and then looks to close the distance. Um, so if this fight stays standing, Co- Covington should be able to hold his own. And then the second it goes to the ground, I expect Covington to secure top position. I don't know if he'll get a finish or not, but I can at least see Covington grinding this one out and not being afraid to uh, just secure top position and, um, you know, pick his spots with the strikes. He's not nearly as dangerous from top position as Mounier is, but again, Covington has faced a lot better competition in the UFC too. So I'm, I'm siding with Kobe Covington here. I probably went by decision. Now dropping down to the women's strawweight division, we have Randa Marcos, who is five and four, taking on Jocelyn Jones Liebarger, who is six and two. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight and how has the public shifted things so far? I put Marcos minus 165. Jones Lieberger was plus 125. And right now, looking over at five times dot EU, it is Marcos minus 185. Jones Lieberger is plus 160. So a little bit more action coming in Marcos's way, but there is two way action in this fight overall. So even though the line's gradually going up a little bit, Jones Lieberger is definitely getting some respect as well. And this should be a competitive fight. I mean, a really competitive fight. In most cases, because Marcos is, has all the talent in the world. I think she is definitely improving her stand-up game. She's more known for her grappling base, for her wrestling, for her submission skill. I mean, just for her ability to, to go out there and put on some great performances, especially early on. I mean, Marcos is kind of top of the food chain at 115, but she's been struggling to get W's here lately, obviously. She's on a bit of a skid. I mean, overall, I believe her resume is at around five and four. She's a much better fighter than that indicates. Uh, it, obviously, and the UFC is behind her and believes that as well. So she needs to definitely get back on track here. But the thing is, with a, a fighter like Jones Liebarger, I think she's flying under the radar a little bit. Jones Liebarger is. Uh, she's not going to get the respect from the overall public that she really should. And she is a very capable fighter. I mean, Jones Liebarger has very good wrestling. She has the ability to push the pace. She likes to com- come forward. She likes to obviously use her hands in boxing. Has a little bit of power. I mean, she hasn't won fights by knockout, but she does have probably more power than people give her credit for as well. And she's able to keep up a consistent pace for three rounds. So I think Marcos is going to have some success early on in this fight, but it gets interesting in round two or three because if any question marks behind Marcos, it's that cardio. I mean, in round two and three, she does tend to slow down a little bit, and that has caused her to lose some close decisions um, so far in the UFC. So Marcos, I think, has to address those issues a little bit, and she's going to be in another war. It's going to be another close fought battle here. I think Marcos does have the edge here. I think obviously she is the better submission fighter. She is the better ground fighter overall. And her, her hands and her boxing has gotten good enough that she can compete with Jones Lieberger early on. But again, I'm a little bit more concerned with round two and three. So as far as a betting standpoint goes, this is a tough fight to bet. But as far as a pure pick goes, I do lean towards Marcos. I think she is the better fighter. She knows she desperately needs to get back on track here and just kind of stay relevant at 115 pounds. I mean, and maybe possibly get on a little winning streak and she could potentially see a title shot at one point, but she's far away from that now. I mean, she's right now she's probably fighting to keep her job. So I think that's going to be enough motivation for her to get the job done here. But man, Lieberger is definitely going to be game and I'm expecting a great fight. So both these ladies can bring it. So my official pick is Marcos in a very, very tight decision. And for me, this fight boils down to whether or not Marcos can get some takedowns. We saw in Marcos's last fight that she had some issues with uh, Kovalkovich in terms of Kovalkovich's volume of striking. Now, Kovalkovich is a terrific stand-up artist, and Marcos was holding her own. I mean, it was a close fight, but uh, I do think this time around, Liebarger is just a very big, strong girl. And if uh, she's able to settle in in the striking, then... Liebarger is just going to start teeing off a little bit on Random Marcos. 
Now, Marcos' stand-up is okay, but, I mean, her biggest strength is her ability to get takedowns, to, to grind opponents out, um, to secure top position. And it worked for her on The Ultimate Fighter. You saw her get surprise upset wins over, like, Tisha Torres. But I think against Liebarger, it's not going to be easy. Liebarger, uh, you know, kind of crouches down, makes it a little trickier to get takedowns. And Liebarger does pack a, a decent pop in her punches as well. So what I see happening here is I think this fight stays standing for the majority of it. And you're going to see Jocelyn Jones Liebarger uh, landing some good straight punches, some short combinations. I don't think she's going to open up too crazy. And uh, I don't expect her to get wild because that's where the opportunities for takedowns will arise. So I'm siding with Liebarger. I think she can either win a decision or maybe she can accumulate enough damage to get a late TKO. So my pick is going to be Jocelyn Jones Liebarger. Now, moving up to the middleweight division, we have Elias Theodoro, who is 12 and 1, taking on Smiling Sam Alvey, who is 26 and 7 with one no contest. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Well, what a kind of tricky fight here with Theodoro coming in. I opened him at minus 265, the comeback on Alvey at plus 185. Right now, Theodoro is getting a little bit more love. He's minus 300, the comeback on Alvey is plus 250. Again, other similar spots as earlier as I was talking about. It's around 280, market price up to 300. So solid three to one favorite here. People are putting uh, Theodoro in parlays, of course. His grinding style, I mean, just the way he goes about things. I mean, his first loss, obviously, was his last fight to Santos. He, he lost by a, a pretty competitive but tough decision for Teodoro. He deserved to lose that fight. I mean, Santos is getting better, and man, is he obviously a force to, to be reckoned with, as we found out uh, recently. But Teodoro is the type of fighter that loves to push a high pace. I mean, he's got striking skill. He, he mixes everything up well with his hands and his feet. Um, so he's very effective with the strikes in all really all angles and ranges. I mean, he could pin you up against the cage. You could get some takedowns. You could take your back as grappling. He's just a very complete fighter. But I hear time and time again that, man, this guy has cardio for days and he could just, you know, he's relentless and he keeps up a high pace and you, you can't get him off you. Well, to me, it looks like, I mean, even before the Santos fight, he does tend to fade as the fight goes on. So in rounds two and three, again, I think there's some question marks with Theodora a little bit. Now, is he going to address those? Hopefully, because, I mean, the guy is definitely a talented fighter. And I think that it, once he gets uh, some issues straightened out, he's going to be even better. And, and one of those issues being, I think his cardio could be a little bit better. His fight IQ could be a little bit better as well. But overall, the guy brings it and he's going to push a high pacing against Alvi. Alvi is underrated. He's been underrated for throughout his whole career, really. Um, has that sneaky good power, too. And he works, obviously, with Team Quest and crew, and he has underrated takedown defense and wrestling in his own right. So I think Teodoro will have some success in this fight, possibly, again, pinning Alvi up against a cage, maybe getting a takedown or two along the way. But Alvi's going to make him work. And as this fight goes in round two and three, it could get very interesting. And then, of course, Alvi doesn't look the part, but, man, he's got that sneaky one-punch knockout power. And, and, and Teodoro, he has a solid chance. He hasn't really shown too much vulnerability, even against a guy like Santos in his last fight. He was tough. I mean, he, he landed some shots, and uh, Theodore took them fairly decent. I mean, he, he survived to, to see the scorecards, and uh, it looked like uh, you know he could have been in some serious trouble at times in that fight. But So I think he's tough enough, and he, he has that no quit in him. So it's not going to be easy for Alvy to get him out of there. So this is going to come down to, I mean, really – who fights smarter and who who's able to push the pace. And I do give the edge to Theodoro. I have to pick him here because at times I complimented Alvi here in this spot, but the negatives about him is he he's tentative a little bit too much at times. He does let people pin him up against the cage. He does not kind of let his hands go when he should. So that might come back to haunt him here. So I know Alvi's motivated for this fight and I, he believes he can win this fight and he possibly might get the job done here, but still with everything, the way they match up, I still got to give the slight edge on the cards to Theodoro. And I think it probably ends up that way. Yeah, Theodoro was definitely the more well-rounded of the two. He showcased a really good wrestling game on The Ultimate Fighter, and he started to showcase it a little bit in the beginning of his UFC career, but he's had a little bit of trouble getting the takedowns going as he has progressed up the, the food chain. And you saw that in his last fight where he just got beaten to the punch by Tiago Santos, just got outkicked, outstruck, and then his takedowns were ineffective. So if he's not able to get the takedown game going against Sam Alvey, he could be in a bit of trouble. Alvey hits like a truck. He's not the most active fighter, 
So Theodoru technically could win a stand-up fight if he's not able to get a bunch of takedowns because Alvi is the type of guy that'll get hit three or four times so he can land that big shot. I mean, you saw the Cesar Ferreira fight well on his way to losing the first round and then landed one big punch and the fight was over. But uh, Theodoru's chin is pretty good, so it's going to take more than one shot, I think, from Sam Alvey to, to put him out. But that being said, if Theodoru does not get the takedowns, then this fight does get a lot more interesting in a hurry. Um, now, Sam Alvey, he's not the most active striker, but he holds his own, and he actually throws about as often and lands about as often as Theodoru. So unless Theodoro can pick up the pace a little bit here and unless he can, uh, you know, bounce back a little bit and maybe turn up the aggression, then I think Sam Alvey could be a live dog. Alvey hits incredibly hard. He's coming off of a, a long layoff himself because of a broken jaw. But uh, I do think that uh, Sam Alvey is still incredibly dangerous. I mean, he is a... Uh, very powerful, big right hand, and I think he's got a lot to prove after that uh, loss to Derek Brunson. So, because uh, before that, I mean, he was on a, a nice little winning streak in the, the UFC middleweight division. So, I'm actually leaning Sam Alvey just slightly, even though Theodoru is the more well-rounded fighter. I think, uh, you know, Alvey's big punching power could make the difference here. So, my pick is going to be Sam Alvey. Now, kicking off the preliminary card on Fox Sports 2, we have a Bantamweight contest between Chris Beal, who is 10 and 2, and Joe Soto, who is 15 and 5. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Man, another tricky fight. I opened Soto minus 140 to come back on Beal, even money. The betters did not agree. They figured or they thought that Beal should be favored. They came in immediately and flipped the line overall. It's not that big of a movement. I mean, for now at five dimes, it's Beal minus 130. The comeback on Soto is plus 110. Line margins have tightened up a little bit as well. So basically flipped the other way. It, it, you know, I can understand it. Soto is so inconsistent. That's what bothers me about him. The guy is ultra talented. I mean, going back to his days at, at Bellator when he was champ at 135, I mean, the guy definitely – had the skill you saw it there i mean he was a dominant champion and so he obviously he got beat but and when he did get beat i mean his his chin became a huge concern and he's been inconsistent with that chin i mean now he's he's been knocked out three times he's been rocked more than that as well throughout his career and he that's what makes him a little bit more inconsistent as far as pure ability goes man the guy's great even his fight with tj dillashaw stepping in on short notice in the ufc i mean that was impressive to say the least i didn't think he was going to hang with uh, dillashaw as well as he did so he he performed a lot better than most thought and that was at the highest level so the guy has a skill even in his last fight against tanaka as well I think he put on a great performance. Tanaka's a stud. So Soto can't compete with the best at bantamweight. There's no question about that. But the problem is that Chin, I mean, look at his loss to Burchek. I mean, Burchek is a very talented fighter in his own right. He has a little bit of power. But, uh, you know, I mean, Soto should be able to, to fare better in that type of matchup there than he did. But give credit to Burchek there. But that's the kind of problems in, or the kind of – question marks you you have to be concerned with with soto so i think a lot of people are fading him here um because of that chin possibly beal does pack a punch he has speed he's got good boxing obviously he's got reach in this spot as well uh, beal typically has decent wrestling now that's been a little bit suspect recently with beal so he's definitely had has to improve on some of those areas but he does have that speed and power in his hands that makes him dangerous to most and a lot of people are expecting some great things with Beal. Well, to me he's underperformed. He's he's really not as good as all of us give him credit for. And I think technically speaking across the board Soto is the much better mixed martial artist here. So Beal's best chance to win this fight is obviously knocking Soto out and that that is possible. It could happen especially early on in the fight. But if it doesn't, Soto's going to win this fight. I believe Soto could even if he gets put on his back, he'll probably end up on on top. In this matchup here, he has the better overall ground game, even on the feet. I mean, Beal, again, will have the length, has a little bit of power, but I think Soto could hang there as well. It's not like he's totally out of his element. He just has to be defensively aware, and hopefully his chin holds up for him if he is going to stand and bang with Beal. So I really give the check marks across the board to Soto. So if he does not get finished, he probably wins this fight. So I'm going to pick Soto to win. I'm going to go against the grain here. I think he's just a more complete fighter. Now, can he get knocked out? Yes, I realize that, but I still got to think that, Hopefully, 
he shows up and his chin holds up and he, he performs like he can because I think it's a winnable fight for him. Chris Beal has all the potential in the world. I mean, he is powerful. He is dynamic. I mean, that flying knee knockout was unbelievable. And he just has not quite shown up ever since. For how dangerous he's capable of being, he's far too often just too willing to sit back and let his opponents dictate everything. And that's how he's lost his last two decisions. I mean, the the Neil Siri fight, even though Beal comes from a bit of a wrestling background, Siri was the one to get in takedowns against him. And then he faced uh, Chris Galatis, a guy that Beal should have been tattooing on the feet. And he kind of let Galatis dictate the pace. Uh, Kaleidas picks up a couple takedowns, and then, boom, Kaleidas wins a split decision. This time around, Joe Soto, you know, he's a guy that can be very inconsistent, but when he's on, Soto is extremely dangerous and way better than we've given him credit for. I mean, his last fight against Tanaka, I mean, he lost, but you could argue definitely that he should have won that fight, could have clearly, absolutely gone either way, and Soto is... Uh, a dangerous striker. He's capable on the feet. And while he's not the best in terms of uh, chin, uh, he can mix things up well. His ground game's pretty good. His uh, submissions are very good. We just really haven't seen a whole lot of that yet in the, the UFC. But if this fight goes to the ground with uh, Soto and Beal, Soto should definitely have an edge. And on the feet, unless Beal lands that big shot, I can see Soto just outworking him. Uh, Beal just sits back way too much. His defense isn't that great. And uh, he definitely uh, just does not have much in terms of output. So what I see happening here is I think Joe Soto just outworks him and can win a decision. And unless Beal hurts him on the feet, then I don't see how Beal can win. So I'm leaning Joe Soto. I'm going to pick him. Now moving back up to the middleweight division, we have Tamden McCrory, who is fourteen and three, taking on Christoph Jotko, who is seventeen and one. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds makers perspective on this one? McCrory, I opened minus one sixty five, the comeback on Jotko plus one twenty five. All of you guys out there that hopped on that minus one sixty five obviously thought it was a bit too low because right now looking over at five dimes, it's minus two fifty for McCrory, the comeback on Jotko is plus two ten. I'm scratching my head a little bit because I do have a ton of respect for McCrory as well. I think he's the best he's ever been, and he's always been a solid fighter, especially, you know, through his first stint. I, I realized that he had an up and down career in the UFC, but coming back to the UFC, I mean I know it's only been his fight over Salmon or his win, his recent win over Salmon, but still that was an impressive win. And then going back to his Bellator days recently as well, McCrory looked great there. I just think he's really found himself. He's kind of been reborn at 185. He's obviously strong. He belongs. I mean, he has the size to be at 185 as well on this UFC run, and he's got the skill set that makes life miserable for a lot of people. I mean, he's got some wrestling. He's got some knockout power on the feet. He's got some submission skill offensively. So this guy is dangerous everywhere the fight takes place. So tough fight for no matter who Sam or McCrory, excuse me, matches up with at 185. But Jocko is one of those guys, man, that he always makes it a tough fight for whoever he faces. I mean, Jotko is one of those guys that you can't really have a lot of success taking him down. His takedown defense overall is pretty solid. His striking is getting better. I mean, he does some really decent work from the outside in his stand-up game. I mean, utilizing that distance, the jab, he sets up everything behind that jab. He sets up his strikes, and, he, and it scores for him. I mean, it works really well. And again, I mentioned his takedown defense is pretty solid. He's always improving, and he had a very solid win over Scott in his last fight. Scott's, I think, a little bit underrated. So Jotko, and honestly, Scott is not McCrory, but at the same time, he has a lot of I guess similar attributes along the way. I think McCrory is just a lot more dangerous as far as finishing skill than obviously, but still that was a pretty solid win. Jocko has put together some very solid wins and performances. So right now looking at that price, I mean, I do favor McCrory to win this fight because I think he's going to be the more dangerous fighter. He's going to be the more aggressive fighter overall. So I think he could basically bully Jocko a little bit. 
Um, even though Jocko is a strong guy. And if this fight hits the floor, I could see Jocko possibly ending up on top as well in, in top position. If he does, obviously that favors Jocko for the scorecards a little bit. And I don't think Jocko is going to get caught by submission here, but McCory is sneaky enough that he could catch something there as well. So Jocko has to be careful if he's playing around on the ground for sure. But overall, what I was really trying to say is that, I mean, at the line right now, I think people are just underestimating Jocko's overall skill. I think he makes life tough and miserable for most fighters, and he's going to do it again here for McCrory. So it was an impressive win in his debut back in the UFC for McCrory, I should say, but Jocko is going to bring it. He's going to be hard to take down. He's going to utilize his striking on the feet, and he's going to be able to hang with McCrory there as well. So this is going to be a close competitive fight. If McCrory does not finish Jocko, which is going to be hard to do, I think it's going to be a coin flip type of decision. So I'm going to pick McCrory to win because I do lean that way, but I just don't agree with all the movement and all the, I guess, disrespect right now that's coming in against Jodko. Tamden McCrory has really looked impressive in his return to the UFC. I mean, the the victory against Josh Saman, I mean, complete domination. He was uh, looking good on the feet and then picks up the submission on the ground. Uh, Saman had no chance. Now, if he's able to just just carve through Jotko's defense and do the same thing, then he can definitely win this fight. I mean, his submissions are better than Jotko's. He's got more power than Jotko. My issue is he is a very quick finisher type of fighter. And if he's not able to get that quick finish, does Jotko settle in and start to get things going with his striking? Now, um, McCrory is the type that just will go balls out hard trying to get the finish. And I expect him to really push a high pace early in this fight. That being said, if it doesn't work, if Jotko's weathers that storm, then I can see Jotko just settling in, start picking his shots. Um, maybe, uh, eventually, especially by about the, the mid second round, I can see him out striking McCrory. Uh, Shotko does have uh, good combinations and once he gets the jab going, it can be a big weapon for him. And, uh, honestly, if this fight goes to decision, I can see Shotko winning it. So even though I know McCrory's the, the big favorite here, if, uh, Shotko is not finished in this fight and it's not extremely easy to put this guy away, he's got a great chin and really you're going to have to submit him probably and you're going to have to catch him, uh, you know, where he's exposed, like if he leaves his neck out on a guillotine or something. And even then, I think it's going to be tricky. Uh, I expect Jotko to just slowly start to take control of this fight as it goes. So I'm uh, leaning Christoph Jotko. I think he pulls off the decision. Now moving up to the light heavyweight division, we have Misha Serkunov, who is 11 and 2, taking on E taking on Ion Kutalaba, who is 11-1. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I open Sir Kunov, minus 280, the comeback on Kutalaba, plus 200, and I'm shocked by the early action in this fight. It's Sir Kunov, minus 185, Kutalaba is plus 160. Now, across the screen again, looks like market price is about 200. So, 2-1 to one favorite for Sir Kunov. Kutalaba getting some respect as an underdog, and I, I do see it somewhat. I mean, stylistically, this is an interesting fight. Starting off with Kutalaba first, he does have a fairly weak European resume overall. I mean, mostly he's beaten journeyman type of fighters for sure. His uh, his only loss was, though, uh, by DQ, and he was actually winning that fight. Uh, he started off losing because he was put on his back, but he ended up scrambling out and getting back on the feet eventually, and then... As the fight progressed, I mean, he was in a spot where he was just smashing his opponent. But uh, unfortunately for him, a lot of those strikes landed on the back of the head, and he got DQ'd for illegal strikes. So he was on his way even in that loss. He was looking good. Um, he does have a judo combat sambo background. Um, so he has that going for him as far as having some stability as far as takedown defense and being able to counter um, guys that are looking to take him to the floor. But he is vulnerable still on the ground as well. He can be put on his back. I mean, that is definitely one of the weaknesses for uh, Kutabala. But at the same time, he is a very dangerous striker. He has a ton of power. He's an athletic guy. I think his ability to scramble up, I mean, again, against journeyman fighters, so it's it, he's taking a big step up in competition here against Rakunov, but 
his ability to just scramble out of bad spots as well, even if he is put on the, on his back, and his athleticism and his power on the feet and his accuracy all make him, I think, a very good prospect, especially age 22. So this guy's legit, and it is a dog or pass situation here. So the early action, I thought, honestly, Sirkunov was probably going to get bet up a little bit because that's typically how the line goes when we post Sirkunov lines. So I was surprised to see some dog action here. But Sirkunov can win this fight with all the stuff I just said about Kudalaba because Sirkunov is a type of guy, obviously – He's a well-rounded fighter, but his strength is definitely his grappling game, looking for takedowns, looking to get the fight to the floor, dropping some ground and pound, looking for the submission. I mean, that's what he does best. And Kudalaba, as I mentioned, can be put on his back. So I think Sirkunov is going to be able to put the fight on the floor, get top position here. He's going to be looking for some subs, but he might lose position along the way. And if he does, Kudalaba's going to get up, and he's going to obviously have a bigger advantage. I mean, Sukunov on the feet's not bad. He does have a little bit of power, but he doesn't want to play the striking game with Kudalaba. So this is a tough fight for me. I'm going to lean a little bit more towards Sukunov because I think he is capable of getting those takedowns and winning this fight on the ground. I'm just not ultra confident in it, though. I think that it is a dog or pass situation, as I mentioned earlier. So all the people that hopped up, hopped in on that plus 200 number, I think you guys did a pretty good job there. But it's still a fight that Kudalaba can lose because he needs to work on that takedown defense just a little bit more. And against a step up in competition like Sir Kunoff, I don't know if he's going to have a ton of success. But this is, should be a good fight, and styles make fights, so it's it's going to be interesting to see how this fight progresses or how it plays out overall. But I'm going to lean a little bit more towards Sukunov in this spot right now. Yeah, this is definitely a battle of styles with Sukunov absolutely wanting to get this fight to the floor, utilize his superior ground game, and uh, Kudalaba clearly wants to keep it standing on the feet. This guy is very dangerous. Uh, Kudalaba has some spinning attacks. He has big power. And if he gets top position after hurting somebody, he puts his opponent away very quickly. Now, uh, Kudalaba, he has some decent grappling instincts, but if he goes to the floor with Sirkunov, I think he's going to be in a lot of trouble. Sirkunov is very dangerous from top position, both with ground and pound and with submissions. And if he is able to grab Kudalaba and get him on his back early in a round, I don't think there's any way that Kudalaba escapes. Um, for the most part, it's mainly because uh, while Kudalaba is able to get to his feet against weaker opposition, Sirkunov is just much more technical than pretty much anybody Kudalaba's faced. Now, that being said, if Sirkunov decides to get cute in there and keep showcasing his improvements in his stand-up, I can definitely see Kudalaba landing something huge and putting him out. Uh, Kudalaba is a very, very potent finisher. I mean, he just buzzsawed through uh, everybody that he was fighting on the, the local circuit. And if Sirkunov gives him an opening on the feet, Kudalaba will take it. So I do think Kudalaba's a live dog, but if this fight goes to the floor, he's in big trouble. So I have to lean Sir Kunov because he's got the UFC experience and he's not taking this fight on short notice like Kudalaba is. So uh, got to side with uh, the veteran and the more experienced, savvy fighter in Misha Sir Kunov. Now heading to the main event of the preliminary card on Fox Sports 2, we have a lightweight contest between Jason Sago, who is 11-2, and two, and Leandro Silva, who is 19-2-1 with one no contest. Now, Nick, what's the MMA Oddsbreaker's perspective on this one? Up in Sago, minus 140, the comeback on Silva, even money. Right now it's Sago, minus 190, the comeback on Silva is plus 165. So it has been bet up a little bit. I do lean a little bit more towards Sago as well. I, I can understand what people are thinking here in this fight, but starting to get to that point where getting to be risky of making a play on Sago for sure, because I mean, these guys are very similar in skill sets. I mean, Sago, obviously he's going to be in front of his home country. He's going to have an advantage there. He's going to be more motivated, obviously as well. He's a, a great ground fighter. I mean, he's capable of getting the fight to the floor working his ground game, working his submission game. If he doesn't get the sub, he can get dominant position and start landing ground and pound as well on the feet. He's not too bad. He has a serviceable stand up game as well. So Sago is a pretty good fighter, underrated fighter. And of course he's uh, been successful thus far and is really in his UFC career. So he, there's a lot to like about him. And against Silva, I think he can have another competitive fight that's a winnable fight for him. I mean, Silva, 
overall, again, his skill set's pretty good. He's really, I guess, kind of more well known for his grappling base as well. But I mean, he he does tend to stand up and uh, bang a lot as well. I mean, he he's a little tentative at times on the feet, but he has a technical skill set. He mixes in kicks well. He has decent boxing. His striking overall is pretty good. He just needs to be a little bit more aggressive. He's one of those guys that does tend to get a little bit too tentative at times. Uh, but his grappling base is very solid. Uh, his top control, if he gets on top, is very good as well. And, of course, he has, has submission games. So these guys are really similar fighters. I think they can neutralize each other out. I think both of them are going to have success on the ground as far as getting top position at times. And I think as far as technical skill set goes, Silva's a little bit more technical on the feet. It's just will he put his foot on the gas and be a little bit more aggressive here. If he does, he could probably win this fight, and he probably will win this fight because this is another coin flip type of fight in my opinion. But I do lean a little bit more towards Sago. Again, I think the home crowd is going to help him here a little bit. I think if it does hit the ground, he might get a little bit more top control. And I think that could sway the judges enough. So it's a very hard fought battle and a hard fought victory for Sago. And it'll be an impressive one because Silva is no easy guy to defeat. So I'm going to lean a little bit more towards Sago. But another spot where I think overall the betters coming in early are probably disrespecting Silva and his chances here in this fight. They're better than the current odds indicate. This is definitely an evenly matched fight. Jason Sago, Leandro Silva, both are uh, very talented on the ground, but I will say Silva should be the better stand-up fighter. While Silva is the more technical striker on the feet, Sago does push uh, a decent pace, and even though he probably won't be able to hang punch for punch with Silva, if he mixes it up, he might be able to take the initiative on the feet because Silva has a tendency to sit back and react a little bit more to what's going on in the fight instead of being the one to push the action. Now, on the ground, Sago is very dangerous. He probably does have the wrestling edge against Silva, although I will give Silva the submission edge. So this fight is very evenly matched. I do think that Sago being the, the hometown fighter, that's probably why he is the, the betting favorite here. Although I was a little surprised to see that the action kept coming in on him because Leandro Silva is somebody you should not be sleeping on anymore at this point. Uh, I've un, I'll admit I've completely underestimated him throughout his UFC run, especially during this little winning streak he's been on. So I think what happens here is uh, Sago looks for takedowns. I don't think they come easy. And... Silva should get the the better of him on the feet, and over the course of three rounds, I don't think it's going to be a runaway decision, but I can see Silva walking away winning two out of three rounds, or maybe just uh, pulling off a, a split decision victory here, so I'm picking with the Brazilian Silva. Now moving on to the main card on Fox Sports 1, we have a women's flyweight contest, the first in UFC history, between Valerie Letourneau, who is eight and four, and Joanne Calderwood, who is ten and one. Now Nick, where did you open this fight and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Letourneau minus one fifty the comeback on Calderwood plus one ten. Right now it's Letourneau minus one seventy five the comeback on Calderwood is plus one fifty five. So for Letourneau I guarantee she's glad that they brought in the flyweight division. This is a good spot for her to be in. I mean, at every weight cut, she seems like at 115 was just brutal. It seemed like it, at least at the weigh-ins. But she did step in the octagon and perform well. I mean, so that was the head scratcher to me because every time we looked at her on the scales, we're thinking, oh man, it's going to be a brutal night for her, but it's not. I mean, so she has that going for her, but this is definitely a more comfortable spot with the weight. And, and this is a definitely a good fight for both ladies here. I think. Letourneau, I mean, she again made it to the top of the food chain. She got that title shot, and she performed a lot better than everybody expected, too, against a Jacek. So got to give her credit. She's a tough woman. She definitely can uh, take some punishment, and she can dish it out almost as well as she could take it. So, I mean, Letourneau has a lot of good qualities about her. She pushes a high pace. She's very smart. She has good takedown defense. I mean, she's very tough out. Now, Calderwood, on the other hand, to me, she's been underperforming. I mean, there's been a lot of buzz around her for a long time now and in the ultimate fighter house she was one of the favorites honestly to win win it all and a lot of people were disappointed by how bad her performances really were in the house and then outside of that i mean coming into the ufc 
she hasn't really performed up to where she can at this point either. So she's had some success, of course, but she still had some letdown fights. And what bothers me, I think, about Calderwood the most is really she's more well-known for her striking ability. I mean, offensively, she has some good striking skill, but defensively, it does concern me because she does get hit a lot. She turns her head when she gets hit. It just It's not a good look for her, but – she can bring it. I think one underrated part of her game is actually her wrestling, and that's going to be the key. If she wins this fight, it's not going to be Calderwood striking that gets the job done here. It's going to be her ability to take the fight to the floor and possibly steal some rounds by getting Letourneau down. Maybe not even holding her down for an awful long time, but enough to maybe sway the judges her way with a, a close competitive decision. So I think Calderwood has that in her a little bit. And it's going to be interesting to see how they match up here because Letourneau overall has pretty decent takedown defense. But I just think stylistically how they match up, I think Calderwood might have a little bit of success there. But overall, I'm still going to lean a little bit more towards Letourneau because I do think if the, she's able to keep the fight upright, really it's her, her fight to win or lose. I think she's going to win it because I think she is the better striker overall. She could take the punishment better. I mean her defense, even though she's hittable as well, obviously she absorbs the punches. And, and I think her defense is a little bit better than Calderwood. So – I do lean towards Letourneau, especially if it's a stand-up affair. But overall, I think it's going to be another very competitive fight. And if Calderwood utilizes that wrestling and makes this a tough fight, she could pull off the upset as well. So another great fight. Again, pleased that the UFC is bringing in the flyweight division for the ladies here as well. So we'd like to see this division grow out. I mean, this is going to be probably a good spot for a lot of ladies to land and be a little bit more comfortable with the weight cut situation that's going on. So... Looking forward to see how this division unfolds, but for right now, I am going to pick Letourneau to slightly, I guess, uh, slightly ahead of Calderwood in this spot and, and get the W here. Yeah, Joanne Calderwood is somebody that was, a lot of people thought, could be a, a title contender, but her big issue is her striking defense is just terrible. Uh, even in fights that she clearly should be dominating, she still was getting hit very hard. I mean, you look at uh, the Courtney Casey fight. I mean, she got rocked there. Sayohi Ham, who is a flyweight, or who is a an atom weight, basically fights at one, 105, very small in the women's strawweight division, and Ham was landing a lot on Calderwood. And then Marina Moroz, uh was lighting Calderwood up before picking up that quick armbar submission. So in three UFC fights, even though she's two and one in them, she has been very hittable. And I think that is a big problem heading into this fight, um, especially because at 125 pounds, all of that extra weight is going to be a benefit to Valerie Letourneau because, I mean, she might look the worst during a weight cut of anybody on the UFC roster. I mean, she just sucks herself out so badly. And uh, I, I, I think that... She was definitely one of the fighters that could, could if they had a women's flyweight division, she would be the first one to sign up. And hopefully this is a, a sign of things to come because uh, I think this is going to be a great move for Valerie Letourneau. She not having to cut those extra 10 pounds is going to be a huge benefit for her in terms of conditioning, in terms of her ability to take a punch. I think this is just going to be a great situation. And, Calderwood, she never really had any major issues making 115 and never really had any bad weight cuts. So this is more just her not cutting a couple extra pounds. It's, I think it's completely night and day difference on the effect that this fight at 125 is going to have on both girls. Now, in terms of the stand-up, while Calderwood is a dangerous striker, has some great Muay Thai ability, uh, mixes things up very well, Letourneau is accurate. She is... Uh, very solid with her punching ability, and I think she is definitely going to be uh, pushing the pace against Calderwood. I mean, Letourneau was holding her own against Joanna young Jacek. That was a competitive fight, especially the first couple rounds, and uh, I think Joanne Calderwood is in for major tr trouble on the feet because of her poor defense. So, uh, what happens here is, I expect Letourneau to just outpace Calderwood. I expect her to connect, to bust up Calderwood a bit on the feet. And unless Calderwood picks up some takedowns along the way, which she is definitely capable of doing, even though she's not really a wrestler, unless Calderwood mixes in takedowns, I think she's in big trouble in this fight. So I'm leaning uh, Valerie Letourneau. I think that she bounces back in a big way. Now moving up to the lightweight division, 
we have Olivier Aubin Mercier, who is eight and two, who is eight and two, taking on Tebald Gaudi, who is eleven and one. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds makers' perspective on this one? I open Aubin Mercier minus three fifteen. The comeback on Gaudi plus two thirty five. Right now, looking over five times, it's Aubin Mercier minus four hundred. The comeback on Gaudi is plus three twenty five. Looking over at market price, it's about three sixties out there, three seventies. So anywhere between three sixty and four hundred for Aubin Mercier right now. Public is favoring him a little bit more, putting him in parlays. I'm sure. Gowdy just doesn't have that respect right now. I mean, unfortunately for him, because he's a pretty solid fighter. He's a tough 22 vet. He did lose his fight to get into uh, the house in a very competitive decision. But, of course, in his UFC debut, he was brought in as a late replacement in, at fight night 84, and he lost to Packlin after being rocked and submitted in the first few seconds of the fight. So it doesn't really sit well, I think, as far as the overall betting community, as far as the MMA diehards out there. They think that Gowdy's probably not as talented as he is, but the guy is a pretty solid fighter overall. Gowdy's a well-rounded fighter. He has a technical skill set. He's got a nice boxing game overall, power in his hands. He likes to push forward. Offensively, he does also look for some takedowns, and he's a very capable grappler. But the problem with Gaudi is he can be put on his back and controlled a little bit, and that's exactly what he's going to face in Aubin Mercier in this spot. Aubin Mercier is one of those fighters, a lot of hype around him, of course. He's a former Ultimate Fighter finalist in his own right. He ended up having a very competitive uh, decision loss in his finale. Um, so he's the type of fighter that's actually improving fight by fight, but he did have a setback, and he was exposed some in his last fight against Ferreira. Uh, he is a talented fighter, Robin Mercier, but he still has room to grow. And part of that is obviously getting his stand-up game a little bit better. It is getting better, but it's still not at the point where he wants to be. He's got a little bit of power on the feet. He, even with his takedown game and his wrestling, he's got to get a little bit better just overall, step up his game. And I know TriStar is a great camp. They're going to work with him, especially getting him back on track after that loss. I mean, this is an important fight for him. And stylistically, it's a fight that he can win. He doesn't want to tangle on the feet too much with Gaudi because I think Gaudi is the better fighter now. But Mercy does have a little bit of power, of course. He's an athletic fighter in his own right. So Gaudi has to be careful because Gaudi's chin has been checked. It's been wobbled before. Of course, I don't have... A, a lot of faith in his chin right now, but overall, I don't think Mercier should give him a ton of problems on the feet. I think Gaudi does have the edge on the feet. He's the more dangerous fighter of the two. So it really comes down to who works their game plan to the to the best ability, and I think it's going to be Aubin Mercier probably grinding out a close competitive type of decision. So Gaudi needs to keep this fight upright and try to utilize the stand-up game. I think he will do that at times, and it's going to make it interesting. But I think overall, Aubin Mercier, especially being in Canada, he's going to be motivated to coming off that loss. I, I believe he can get the job done here and, and pull off a very close and competitive decision. Maybe even finish Gaudi as the fight goes a little bit, but I still lean a little bit more towards uh, Aubin Mercier. Now, where the line is right now at minus 400 or close to it, I would definitely be concerned as a better. I would probably – be careful on this fight because I don't think there's a lot of value either way in this spot. It's probably one of those fights that you probably want to stay away from at this point, but we'll see how it plays out. So my pick officially is I've been mercy in a close competitive battle. This fight's pretty straightforward. Uh, Alvin Mercier is pretty much a grapple or nothing type of guy, all or nothing with the, the wrestling. He's not a tremendous submission threat. He's not a big threat with ground and pound. I mean, his fight against Tony Sims, he threw like two or three strikes, even though he was in top position for like 13 out of the 15 minutes. I mean, he's just still a bit raw in terms of how dangerous he can be when he does get you on the ground. Now, Tebow Gowdy, he is a good, solid striker. He mixes things up pretty well. He's got decent boxing. He can kick and... Uh, if Mercier does not get him on his back, then Gaudi can win this fight. Uh, now, obviously, Gaudi's UFC debut was a complete disaster. Uh, Pekelin rocked him on the feet and then submitted him quickly on the canvas. I mean, just, it was over in 20 seconds. That is not going to happen this time around, uh, because Mercier doesn't have any punching power and he doesn't really try to do anything on the feet. So... Uh, and, and as you saw in his last fight, when Mercier faced somebody that could hold their own in the grappling department against him in uh, Carlos Diego Ferreira, uh, Mercier just got handled. So uh, Gaudi's definitely going to need to keep those hands low to try to and, and be prepared to sprawl. And if he's able to do that, then maybe he can make something happen. But uh, honestly, 
if they were that concerned about Gowdy pulling off a huge upset, then I doubt they would have put this fight on the main card. So I expect Alvin Mercier to bounce back. I expect him to win impressively, just uh, one-sidedly with the, the offensive grappling and either by decision or maybe he actually wears Gowdy down to the point that he can get a finish. So my pick is going to be Alvin Mercier with that uh, offensive wrestling. Now moving up to the light heavyweight division, we have Steve Bossy, who is 11 and 2, taking on Sean O'Connell, who is 17 and 7. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Up in Bossy, minus 160 to come back on O'Connell, plus 120. So very competitive line. Right now, it's still staying that way. Bossy, minus 155 to come back on O'Connell is plus 135. So line margins basically tightened up a little bit, and there is two way action coming in on this fight. This is interesting. I mean, Bossy is staying up at 205 here. O'Connell is one of those guys that's probably better than everybody gives him credit for. But at the same time, two of his three losses have come by KO in the UFC thus far. And he's overall, he's two and three. So he's one of those guys that if you don't get rid of him, I mean, he will be on you and make the fights difficult because of his overall style. I mean, he's kind of a grinder. He, he likes to get in your face. He has a bit of a stand-up game. Um, he's a, an aggressive type of fighter. He has the wrestling background to go along with it. even has some sub-skill. I mean, he's, his, he's been subbed a couple times as well, but he does have a pretty complete overall game, and I think he's the type of fighter that can steal decisions or at least be competitive enough, obviously, along the way. So this is not going to be one of those fights, though, because obviously somebody's probably getting finished here. I mean, both these guys have been knocked out in the past, and both these guys like to throw the leather, and uh, I mean, I'm sure somebody's getting put to sleep, and I think that somebody's probably O'Connell. Again, a guy coming off of two out of three of his losses have been by knockout against the guy that hits really hard, Bossy. I know that his loss to Santos was kind of embarrassing for him in some ways, but again, that was a short notice fight. That was a crazy stylistic matchup as far as how big Santos was over him. I mean, the, the height and the reach advantage. It was a total different matchup here. I think Bossy obviously bounced back, performed well against it. Who know a lot of people were counting him out of that fight. And overall, I think Bossy's been kind of disrespected throughout his career. A lot of people don't believe that he's really that good. I mean, he's that hockey enforcer that is trying to convert his MMA game over. But you know what? If you look at his resume, look at where he trains, he's better than everybody thinks. I hear about his cardio being bad. Yes, it's not the greatest, but I don't think it's quite as bad as everybody thinks. And again, his takedown defense, I hear about that as well. I think his takedown defense is actually decent. I mean, he's been putting the work in. You get him on his back, yeah, but at the same time, it's hard to keep him there as well. And then on the feet, obviously, Bossy has that intelligence that i mean he knows he can knock people out he has that accuracy about him as well and he's got the power to do so so bossy's a very dangerous opponent for most guys at either middleweight or light heavyweight because of his fighting style and the fight with o'connell really plays into his hands pretty well because even if o'connell's trying to get bossy to the ground i don't think he's going to have a great deal of success doing so and on the feet even though again bossy you got to be worried about his chin a little bit and his conditioning throughout to go three hard rounds Still, I don't think it's going to play out that way, and I think Bossy's going to be able to catch O'Connell before it kind of gets a little bit, you know, extended over to that sp spot where he might start fading and might start gassing a little bit more. So I think Bossy, this is a good fight, and this is a winnable fight for him. I know O'Connell's going to bring it. He wants to obviously stay on the roster, and he knows this is a, almost a must win situation for him, but I do believe that the Bossy's probably going to catch him and put him out. I mean, he, just with his accuracy and his power and O'Connell's chin, I think Bossy's probably going to knock him out. So I'm going to pick Bossy to win this fight. Both guys hit incredibly hard. Both guys have suspect chins, especially O'Connell. So honestly, it's going to come down to whoever lands that first big shot. Now, O'Connell is going to be a little bit bigger than Bossy because Bossy can make middleweight. Um, but moving up to light heavyweight, he looked great. Ended up picking up that very quick finish against James Tahuna. So Bossy has proven that he can go out there, take care of business against people that have suspect chins. So if he does, did it against Tahuna, he can definitely do it against O'Connell. Now, O'Connell is scrappy. He's been in some very entertaining type type of fights against uh, guys like uh, John Volante, and he has picked up some uh, knockouts along the way. But that being said, uh, for the most part, he has been on the receiving end of some big knockouts. Obviously, the the last one against Alir Latifi that was over in a hurry, um, and then the UFC debut against Ryan Jimmo uh, again. 
was uh, knocked out in the first round. So I can definitely see that happening this time around. Uh, now, Bossy, I think even though he did get knocked out in his UFC debut, uh, that was just an insane head kick, and you're not going to see Sean O'Connell doing that. So it's going to be a lot more traditional uh, attack from uh, from O'Connell. So I think Bossy will be able to see it coming a lot easier, be able to do avoid it. And even though O'Connell does push a high pace, and tries to sucker his opponents into brawls. I think if Bossy can keep his distance and just wait and strike at the right moment, I think he'll land, and I think he will put O'Connell out. So my pick is going to be Steve Bossy. Now dropping down to the welterweight division, we have the co-main event of the evening between Donald Cerrone, who is 29-7 with one no contest, taking on Patrick Cote, who is 24-9. Now, Nick... What's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I put Cerrone minus 190 to come back in Coach A plus 150 right now over at five times. It's minus 160 plus 140. Market price about 170, 145 out there, 150 is out there. So it's, it's basically staying close to where it opened, but line margins have tightened up a little bit as well. Two way action coming in this fight. There is decent action coming in on both guys so a lot of split opinions on this fight as well a lot of it really is to do with Cerrone being again up at 170 Cote obviously has fought at 185 in the past he's had success at 170 he's looked great he's looked like I mean he's been really reborn in, at 170 pounds and I mean he's been working hard on his grappling game he's been working hard in his wrestling he's always had good stand-up so Cote has become a very complete fighter now as he ages a little bit, uh, to me, I get a little bit more concerned. But, man, he's obviously putting in the work that, I mean, the age hasn't really been that much of a factor for Cote thus far. So this is going to be an interesting fight because overall, skill has to still go to Cerrone. I mean, the guy obviously can strike with the best of them. He has the grappling to submit most guys, even if they can't be submitted. I mean, if they have good submission defense, a lot of times Cerrone has that sneaky good submission game with that length to go along with it. I mean, he's, he's got technical skill. He can get the job done where others might not at times. So Cerrone's dangerous everywhere the fight takes place. Obviously, he can even be competitive enough on the feet to just, you know, uh, kind of point out point a person by decision as well so Cerrone has a lot of ways to win this fight a lot of people are kind of bringing up the factor that Cote is going to be physically strong can Cerrone deal with that kind of power I think he can I mean Cerrone's faced the best of the best throughout his career I think he's going to be okay in this position as well in this spot I think he is the more technical fighter he's the more dangerous fighter in this spot as well so if Cote survives this fight and he very well could I mean again he's defensively he's definitely tightened up even his submission defense he's not an easy guy to sub anymore and I mean his chin overall has been okay throughout his career it's been pretty solid at, at times though I thought that it was we're going to see maybe it possibly go but it's held up pretty decent overall um, so if Cote does survive, it could be interesting on the cards for sure. I mean, he's a very likable fighter. Obviously, he's going to have a whole country behind him in Canada as well. So he's going to have the fan support. He's going to have, I mean, maybe that hometown bias a little bit as well. But it's still going to be tough for him to beat Cerrone. I just think that Cerrone will find a way to win the fight, whether it's on the cards or even before it hits the scorecards. I think Cerrone's just the better fighter even though it's out of his weight class. And I kind of want to see Cerrone go back down to 155, to be honest with you. I don't like the fact that he's going to fight at 170, even if he has a little bit of success. I think eventually it's going to come to a point where he's not going to have that success and he's going to probably go back down. So to me, he's just kind of buying time right now at 170. And I think this is a winnable fight for him. So he should still get the W here. I'm going to go with uh, Cerrone to maybe even finish Cote before it hits uh, the scorecards. This definitely isn't going to be an easy fight, especially if Donald Cerrone comes out of the gate a little slow, as he has tended to do throughout his career. But uh, Donald Cerrone is just the better overall fighter in just about every single area compared to Patrick Cote. Uh, Cerrone is the more technical striker. He has a much more dangerous overall ground game, in my opinion, and... Uh, while Cote is scrappy and has a lot of punching power, Cerrone can mix it up, and I think he hits just as hard as Cote. Now, uh, the one area that maybe Cote has an edge is uh, Cerrone, even though he doesn't have a bad chin, he does is a little bit vulnerable to the body if 
Kote mixes it up, not just trying to headhunt and maybe starts working uh, some of those big punches to the body as well, he might catch uh, Cerrone sleeping a little bit. Now, uh, for the most part, though, Donald Cerrone should be able to keep his distance and turn this into a kickboxing fight. And there is where he has a huge edge. Uh, his kicks are extremely potent and dangerous. He can chew up Patrick Cote's legs. And if he uh, lands with a head kick, it could be lights out. Now, Patrick Cote has been known for being extremely durable throughout his career, but that is definitely starting to change. Um, you saw it, uh, you know, in the Alessio Sakara fight where he was pretty much finished and then ended up being a DQ. But, uh, uh, even in the, the Berkman fight, I mean, they were taking years off of each other's life in that fight. Um, uh, just absolutely creaming each other. And, uh, Ber and Berkman and Cote both got rocked and hurt badly at multiple points. So I do think, as long as Cerrone doesn't uh, play into Cote's game too much and he keeps this technical, there's almost no way that he can lose. So my pick has to be Donald Cerrone. Now moving on to the main event of the evening, another welterweight contest. We have Rory McDonald, who is 18 and 3, taking on Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, who is 12 and 1. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened McDonald minus 150 to come back on Thompson plus 110. This line has been all over the place. I mean, early action came in towards Thompson. The line flipped. Action started going back towards McDonald. Line flipped back and forth. And now, right now, over five times, it is Thompson minus 115 to come back on McDonald is minus 105. So virtually a pick em. And I think we'll see it continue to be that type of fight here overall because Roy McDonald's going to get some respect for sure. I, I know really it wouldn't even be that close. I mean, this was kind of a hard line to set because, in my opinion, McDonald might be the best overall welterweight right now. I know Robbie Lawler has something to say about that because he was the one to defeat McDonald twice. But that being said, I mean, that war that he had with Robbie Lawler in his last fight was – I mean, he was on his way to a victory. Unfortunately for him, Lawler got the job done before it hit the scorecards. And, I mean, that was a brutal fight. That That's the type of fight that really – we're not going to be sure how much of an impact it had on McDonald's career. So I think that's the biggest question mark here. I mean, the beating that he took, hopefully it doesn't have a negative impact on him, but it very well could. So in most cases, I mean, McDonald is the better fighter here. He has a serviceable stand-up game above that. I mean, obviously his stand-up is really good. He's he just, McDonald's really good everywhere the fight takes place. I mean, on the ground, he's got a good submission game. His stand-up game is legit as well everywhere. I mean, so he's a very complete fighter. That's why I think skill-wise, he is probably the best welterweight right now. I mean, you can argue that. I mean, there's a few guys that are in that category as well, but still, I mean, he, he really, there's no doubt in my mind that he could be wearing the UFC gold and he might again in the future. It all depends on again, how much that Lawler fight really took out of him and how much the wars he's been going through have, have taken a toll on him because let's not forget. I mean, this guy has been competing since a young age. I mean, he's still 26 years old, but in fight years, he's way beyond that. So we'll see. I mean, that's the question marks I have surrounding McDonald. Now Thompson, on the other hand, of course we all know his background. I mean, he's a phenomenal striker. I mean, a world-class striker, accurate. You don't really, get to train well for a guy like Thompson because of his unorthodox style. Now, I know Rory McDonald and crew had guys like Raymond Daniels coming into to TriStar to kind of mock and mimic Thompson's style, which Raymond Daniels, I mean, you can't get much better than that as far as a striker goes. Raymond Daniels is phenomenal. Of course, he's a glory fighter. But before that, I personally knew Raymond Daniels from the, the sport karate circuit. I mean, the guy was in, – in the sport karate world, Raymond Daniels was basically like a Michael Jordan. I mean, that's how – dominant the guy was in sport karate competition then of course that carried over into kickboxing he was able to adopt adapt good there as well so raymond daniels is going to definitely be a good asset to a guy like mcdonald here and he's actually fought thompson in the past as well uh, i believe it was in world the world combat league so he's going to be able to, to definitely help 
McDonald get ready for Thompson, but still, you can't really imitate that exact style. And it, it doesn't matter. I mean, how well you train for it. Once, once it's in there, even though you, it helps a little bit, it's still going to be a tough fight because Thompson does have those unorthodox angles. I mean, his front leg is just lethal with that roundhouse kick. I mean, just the accuracy with the power. It doesn't seem like he's, he's throwing it very hard, but it lands very well. So his takedown defense, Thompson overall is getting to the point where he's not an easy guy to take down. His fight IQ is getting better. In my opinion, one of the worst parts of his game, honestly, or especially early on in his career was his cardio. That cardio seems to be getting better as well. So this is going to be a test though still. I mean, if McDonald does hold up and Thompson can't get rid of him early on, I think McDonald actually starts taking over this fight and I wouldn't be surprised at all if he wins. This is a difficult fight for me to break down or to, to actually pick because of I mean, Thompson will and should have some success on the feet against McDonald, but McDonald is the better overall fighter, and he should be able to get the W here. So I'm going back and forth on this fight, and I will continue to probably go back and forth on this fight. So Pickham's a pretty accurate line here, I think. So I'm going to go with Thompson a little bit more because I think he's made the most progress um, out of the two recently. I mean, he is stepping up his game to a whole other level. I like what I'm seeing with him. I mean, that win over Hendricks was impressive to say the least. I mean, that was who's done that to Hendricks. So that's the kind of momentum Thompson's coming in here with. Of course, these guys know each other. They've trained together in the past as well. So he knows what McDonald's going to come after and vice versa. So this is going to be a tough fight for both guys. So I'm leaning a little bit more Thompson because I guess I have a little bit more fear of where McDonald is at this point of his career. But man, this is a tough one to call. So slight, slight lean towards Thompson. If he gets the job done here, Man, it's hard to argue that he doesn't deserve that title shot. I mean, Thompson's going to be right there. He deserves it, in my opinion, if he gets a win over McDonald. And the guy very well could be wearing that UFC gold. I mean, that's how talented he is on the feet. And stylistically, if he can keep himself upright against these wrestlers that he's going to face eventually, I mean, the guy can have a little reign as a welterweight champion as well. So this is an important fight for both guys. I'm going to slightly lean towards Thompson to get the W here. Now, if this fight had taken place about a year ago, I'd have been – all over Rory McDonald, but things change. Uh, Steven Thompson has taken it to a whole nother level. Uh, obviously the win over Jake Ellenberger, he got hurt and then bounced back, landed a pair of insane spinning heel kicks to, to pick up the win. And then the, the most recent performance against Johnny Hendricks. I mean, he could not have looked any better in that fight. And Rory McDonald, I mean, he was literally minutes away from being crowned the UFC welterweight champion, but uh, got crushed in the nose. I mean, his nose, I mean, people have, you know, kind of talked smack a little bit about how he got jabbed in the nose and then hesitated and waited a couple seconds and then dropped and the fight was over. But if you go back and watch that punch in slow motion, it shattered his nose. It did serious major damage that required, I think, comprehensive reconstruction. And, you know, that's tough to come back from. And that's why he hasn't fought since that fight at UFC uh, 189 in uh, July of last year in Vegas. So very, very difficult uh, moment for Rory McDonald in his career. But that being said, I mean, he is still the most well-rounded and perhaps the most capable and dangerous fighter in the welterweight division. So if he's not affected, you know, mentally and physically by that punch, by that second loss to to Robbie Lawler, then he should be able to win this fight. I mean, his jab is on point. Um, he is huge in the welterweight division and he should be able to close the distance, maybe pick up some takedowns, just mix things up a little bit against Stephen Thompson. But if he is hesitating, if he's gun shy at all, if he is not, you know, a well-oiled machine in every aspect of the game, then Stephen Thompson is going to run circles around him on the feet. Thompson is so dynamic and so capable. He might be the best striker in the entire UFC roster. And that's not hyperbole. Like he is, his, uh, jabs are great. I mean, just knocked out Robert Whitaker with the jab pretty much. Kicking game is perhaps the most dangerous kicks on the UFC roster. And, uh, he has really started to improve the takedown defense as evidenced by how easily he thwarted, you know, whatever Johnny Hendricks was trying to throw at him, which wasn't much. So. 
and, and the power is there. I mean, Johnny Hendricks, granite chin, and puts him out in the first round. So, you know, this is definitely somebody that you cannot sleep on at this point. And this fight is about pick em odds. And Stephen Thompson, I think I'm starting to lean that way. I mean, he could be looking, if he wins this fight, we could definitely be looking at the next UFC welterweight champion, whoever wins this fight, honestly. But I am starting to lean a little bit more towards uh, Stephen Thompson. I'm starting to believe in the Wonder Boy, so I'm going to pick him. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC Fight Night 89. Part 2 of the Premium Odds cast featuring our premium bets will be out this Friday following the weigh-ins. So stay tuned for that if you're an MMA Oddsbreaker Premium member. Also, if you'd like to become a premium member, just go to MMAOddsbreaker.com and you can sign up in the top right corner of our homepage. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOBPremium on Twitter because that's where we'll post them first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsbreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Special thanks to our sponsor, Five Dime Sportsbook. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend.